My first recollection of Candler Park was when I was very, very small. I, in fact, I don't remember how old I was, but I had a nurse, and we used to go through the woods, which was in front of this house, over to over to Smith Street, which is now Candler Park Drive. And I can remember seeing them play golf. I didn't know what they were doing at the time, but I remember there was a down in the bottom, about a hundred yards, there was a what we call a green, but it was uh, made out of clay. And I told them that. Now that must have been in about 97, or six, 90, about 95 or six. I just was little. Candle Park was not there at that time. There was a pasture there where we'd take the cows and turn them out to pasture. Candler Park, as such, as I said, was uh, uh, where we used to go and swimming and all. And every year, this colored church that was down on Oakdale uh, would have a big baptizing. They'd have a revival meeting, and they'd baptize about 50, and they'd come down. And if you've never seen a, a baptized in a creek, you missed a whole lot because it did a lot of shouting and jumping and muddy the water noise. And we, uh, we had uh, a whole lot more territory to play in than they have now. We had a lot of woods around here. Over at uh, where Kennel Park is now was all woods. Then I was in the Boy Scouts and we went on out as far as uh, present Lake Clare area. And all woods, no nothing in there, no streets, no anything. In fact, McClendon didn't go all the way through back in those days. Might have been a wagon trail through there. Had been as much as could have gotten through. In the afternoons, you could uh, hear the children practicing their piano lessons all up and down the street. In fact, all of the community, which you don't ever hear anymore. It's just a thing of the past. Changes in uh, the early 1900s were very uh, slow. We didn't uh, uh, have a lot of uh, new buildings, new homes. It was Edgewood, Georgia had its own post office. It's right up here at the corner. And uh, that was the hub of the activity. That was the post office. Then uh, a few years later, it was incorporated into Atlanta. Of course, later on, uh, this section went into the city of Atlanta in 1907, and we got mail delivery and so-called garbage pickup. And uh, we had got water and sewage and electric lights. Well, we had Cab Avenue there and a uh, uh, double track uh, streetcar line going to Decatur. Transportation, of course, new families moved in and there was no great uh, uh, surge of increase in population. It was a gradual, uh, grand, gradual growth. And we had stores all up and down in this block. There's a blacksmith shop up there in about midway of the block and uh, grocery stores on each corner. I've been selling groceries over 45 years on this corner. It was a thriving neighborhood. We had a complete neighborhood. It was just like a small country town downtown Atlanta. People shopped in the neighborhoods then. They uh, had, to, uh, had to. There was no transportation other than a streetcar and a few automobiles. Then uh, in 1925, the changes came in. The city bought up all the, the houses that was used for colored people on that street and made uh, Maryland School. Saw the park come along and the golf course and the school, new school over there being built. And named, named after my old first grade teacher, Mary Lynn. She taught me in the first grade in 1901, and she taught school until she was whipped in the ripe old age of about 80. We've always been like a small country town. When I need anything, I don't care what it is, a roofer, 
Thank you very uh, somebody much. Somebody to do my yard. And I can go down there and find out anything I want to find out. The lady needed money for babysitter. We paid it. They can pay us later. It's kind of a center. You know, a lot of people go in there in the morning and sit all day and talk. Retired, older folks. Your, your people know everybody. They get along fine. If something happens to one of them, they flock in and help them, just like you're out in the country. But we've been right downtown Atlanta all these years. So. Well, the only the big change, of course, has been the number of uh, apartments that come in, replacing the old homes. Most of the houses in this section and in the uh, Candle Park section, uh, own, owners lived there. There were very few rental units. Uh, of course, when the apartments come in, they uh, bring in a good many more people. Well, the decline was when the older people that lived in here years ago began to pass on and move away. Some of them moved away. And uh, the area went down because of that, and tenants moved in. And, and some of them have no regard for the property, tear it up. You wouldn't believe how some of the property's gone down here because of that very thing. I lived here when I was a kid. I lived here when I was about nine and 10 years old. And it was a bad neighborhood then. It was, it was poor. It was very violent. Um, house I lived in was three rooms with the floor falling out in one room and holes in the walls and in the ceilings and rats running through it all the time. I don't know, it's just that people didn't seem to have enough respect or the kind of respect they should have had for other people's property. Like where I lived, there was a there was a 13-year-old prostitute living across the street from me. It was It was a bad neighborhood back then. I've lived in the neighborhood around 18 years the houses, houses, you know, itself went down some because probably the people couldn't afford to, you know, buy and keep them up. I think what happened was a lot of the houses and the places we first started moving into were houses and places that used to have a lot of transients coming through them. Uh, I lived in Callum Park for 10 years, and you meet uh, neighbors off and on. Some stay here a year, two, three. They moves away, new moves in, you know them two, three, they moves away. Between 1960 and 1970, the neighborhoods to the south had moved from 100, almost 100% white to 100% black. Uh, among older residents, that was real fear. Candle Park was originally Mason Avenue, and then Whiteford Avenue down there is original name now Oakdale up to the railroad here. The old original names are still on the south side of the railroad and it's all black on that side of the railroad. It just started deteriorating and then all the businesses in the Little Five Point area moved out and now we don't have anything here. Well, it's been a gradual change. It's been over the last 10 years that there's been a big change. Well, we had barber shops and we had beauty shops and dry cleaners and we have, there's two grocers all the time. I was, was another one all along when I was here. This became the neighborhood that a lot of the people who were hippies in the late 60s started moving to when the hippie area got weird. A lot of the original hippies that were art students and college students wanted to get away from that mess that happened down there. And this is one of the areas they moved to. A lot of the reason for that was because the rents were low. And then the riffraff started moving in. I ain't saying who the riffraff is or anything because they know who it is. If you're not fenced in, well, they take over and, and uh, it was like it was theirs. They just run roughshod over you. The teenagers around here, they're kind of wild. There are certain streets around here in this neighborhood that uh, certainly lack in visual appeal. Fifteen years ago, it was safer and more beautified than it is today. You end up with a lot of ugliness. And, you know, that was part of what set all these neighborhoods up, for the rents to be real cheap 
for the young college students to move in, for the hippies to move in. For a while, we had a decline because we had homeowners mostly in the years past. Then they had renters. Now people are buying the houses and moving back. Young people with a lot of vinegar. I see people, you know, moving in, fixing up old houses. Well, they're fixing up homes. I think a lot of those people moved in because of the beautiful old houses, and they wanted to renovate them and make them nice. Another change in the neighborhood is that they're starting to fix up the shops up on the, the street on McLendon. I knew we should have bought them a long time ago. <laughs> now, they have all filled back up. We've got uh, different type uh, businesses. We've got artists and glass uh, silk screen and glass blowers and, and such as that, where we had before, we had a little different operation. We have had to take beer and wine to go with the, the demands of the per people. We waited some time to buy it, but it has been worked out to be a good part of the business. Um, even the little Five Points pub, 20 people out of the community went together and bought that place. Well, the pub started about three years ago. This particular location, we thought, was uh, created a problem for Little Five Points um, because it was a, a rough place. You know, it used to be you couldn't go through that intersection without fear of running over a, an indigenous lane on the sidewalk or in the street. And instead of being a place that people avoided, would be a, a place where people would gather, community people. You know, well, the little Five Points pub is, uh, is a meeting place now. I go to the pub and have a drink or dinner or lunch, and it's just exciting because all these people are here because they really want to be here. Um, they have all kinds of art-type things going on there. Uh, so it becomes an outlet for the creative, um, uh, the artistic people in the community. Um, and of course, with our profit sharing plan, some of the money goes back into community projects that would benefit Candler Park as well as the other uh, neighborhoods in the, uh, in the area. Also, there's a community organization. Uh, I can't quite remember the name of it. It's Candler Park organization that's real involved. Uh... Their objectives were to bring back something which seems to have disappeared, and that is relating to one another as, as neighbors and not as economic units. All right, but I, I just really haven't seen no action. They do all this big talking, but no action. And they fostered that idea that it would be open, that it would be for everyone. They represent a portion of the neighborhood, but they're not a true representative faction, in most cases, of the whole neighborhood. The people I worked with on the Candler Park Committee were lots of young professionals, 30 to 40. Um, Well, I think they're trying to, you know, help build up the neighborhood and get the people to working together in the neighborhood. Uh, I don't think they've had a whole lot of progress. Here, with, I don't feel like I'm living in a city. I feel very, very um, safe and sound in my own little, little neighborhood. See, last year when I got robbed for the sixth time by the same gang of kids, uh, the cop told me, says, well, I'm sorry, but we've got one officer between uh, something like uh, Highland and Ponce de Leon and Candler Road in Decatur. And they were here in, you know, two minutes or something, and tended to it. It's hard to get a cop on this street. Before I moved into this house a little over three years ago, there was more crime then than there is now. I mean, I lived in Chicago where you just, you didn't even talk to your neighbors, you know. I mean, you know, I was only robbed once in Chicago. Oh, no, not what it was, when, really, when we first came here. Because I could get out, you know, and stroll the children. They was babies in. And... This particular neighborhood has been a very low crime area. Well, there's a lot of crime here. The reason he went out of business is the, the dope, dopers stole all of his merchandise. They broke in on him six times in, in 10 weeks, something like that. And I hear a lot about the crime rate, but I really personally have not been involved in it. They breaking in houses, stealing stereos and stuff. But really, not too many crime on this street. 
We haven't had a lot of problem with crime in this house. We've we, Our house got broken into last week by some kids. Well, I wouldn't want my children to be out after dark, you know, on the streets because there's so many different, uh, maybe things, people breaking into homes and things like that. I see more things happening in the park for neighborhood people to be involved in. I think there's a lot of the younger people that maybe smoking pot and things like that. That's the reason I wouldn't want my children in the park. Because I just don't feel like they'd be safe in the park. I took a friend to the park last year for the Candler Park uh, Festival. And she was just amazed at the kind of diversity that was represented there. And I said, well, this is just the way this neighborhood is. There, there's a lot of interest in Candler Park in a, a mixed community where a lot of different kinds of folks uh, from a lot of different styles can, uh, can live together. A lot of renters, they'd be students, older whites and blacks. They're young professionals and uh, they're old folks who've been here 40 or 50 years or more. There's poor people here and black people and ex-hippies and practicing hippies and college students and gays moving in. There's not that prejudice that they'd find out in the suburbs. About the homosexuals and things like that. Now, I wouldn't want my children in the park, uh, you know, because my son had something like that to happen to him, so I just really wouldn't want him in the parks. There's every age group. There's every sexual preference. I mean, there's everything. You're having more uh, single persons and also gay couples buying in. Now around here, uh, women's and women's are living together, men's and men's. In looking back over the past three and a half years of real estate in Candler Park, uh, there was a time, say, three years to about two years ago, when a lot of families had moved in. We uh, don't have as many children in here now. We have some, not many. Uh, I would say more than 50% of the people that are moving into a neighborhood such as this here, specifically in Candler Park, are young families. There's no more, there's hardly no young families live around here. The family unit, that's what a neighborhood is to me, it's, it's families. And uh, if you've got a bunch of single adults and a bunch of couples, you haven't got any families. Uh, the people that are moving in now, since the, the prices and the rents have doubled or tripled or quadrupled, are primarily young professionals. They have to be to qualify for the houses. You know, the whole process of, of trying to create the sort of community we want also has the effect then of making it more desirable and therefore more, um, more saleable. I think right now it is not quite as affordable as it was, say, a few years ago. Things have changed a lot. Prices have gone up by four times what the houses sold for back in 1977. Well, property values have gone crazy. Prices going up on uh, old houses. It's really worn down, really. People got into a bidding situation over a house, and a house would sell for sometimes several thousand more than we had priced it at. And it led, it led me to believe that if I ever wanted to put this on the market, my God, I could make a killing. What we're, what we're doing is it's getting priced out of the range of young college students, of, of poor people, of people just struggling to get started with their careers. Some of the people who have always rented and wanted to just rent in this community, uh, particularly the artists, don't have a lot of money. Um, With the low, low rents, you know, it got set up for people to start moving in now. I don't know what's happening to some of the poor people. I think they're basically getting bumped on to other areas. And that's, that's really kicked in the black people's out of the neighborhood. Particularly the... Um, the older members of the community are dying or being displaced, really. They're seeing, they're, they're, they're succumbing to the temptation to make the money. They think they can... Can sell off and walk away from a closing table with, say, 20, 30, 40, or $50,000 cash. They need some security. Us older people who already raised our families, uh, it's hard for us to have the enthusiasm they have. I'm afraid black people are moving out, and I don't like that because I really like living in a mixed neighborhood. They move from here across the track because of the mortgage. The blacks say that they don't want to be the only black people in the area, and I think they feel uncomfortable living in with, with the young professional whites. But the black people, well, just like go over across the track, live in a cheaper place. 
like I walked up to the store last week and as I walked up to Little Five Points and as I was walking up there I counted the number of houses that looked like they belonged to poor people and it looked like only about one in four or one in five which really changed is from like five years ago where it used to be every other house or just about every house. Most of the neighbors in the neighborhood have constantly upgraded their particular properties. People are taking an enormous amount of pride in the neighborhood. Either the houses have been bought by a contractor and fixed up already and then you buy it at the price you know, marked up for all the repairs they've done. You can find houses that you need to be fixed up, but mostly they're already very expensive. Every one of us, all of us in the neighborhood have agreed that property values have gone up on a very steady basis. But over the last three years, there's been a lot of speculation in real estate. And then this eliminates lower income people. They're being displaced because the houses they are renting or the apartments they're renting are being sold out from under them and uh, a young speculator is moving in. There was a time when you could buy a house for 15 and sell it up two, three months later, just swept out for 25,000, so there was a lot of easy money. A company buys a house for 20, say $25,000 and less than a year later, they put improvements on it, which don't really expand the house or do anything to make it other than just make it prettier. Then they turn around and they charge forty-five or fifty thousand dollars for that house. And then the realtor company, the only thing that's interesting is the money. Really. They're opposed to real estate agents because they single us out, unfortunately, as a scapegoat of, of the uh, quote unhealthy change or the rise of prices, the, the making of in-town neighborhoods, the new white suburbia. Uh, and we're not, we're just really a function of the market. What's happening now to, to change has, has been that there's more and more emphasis on this community as, a, as an investment and more and more emphasis on material values uh, and less, as I see it, particularly the new people coming in, less sensitivity to the human values here. We're trying to set an example. If this area looks good, it's going to make those people feel bad in the respect that their property values are not going to go up. There's a strong tendency for a community to, uh, to become homogenous, to become for uh, people to be very much like each other. Well, I think uh, the most important thing right now is to see that uh, everybody maintains their property as it is now and upgrade the thing in uh, in their own time, because under the circumstances, uh, obviously, the property values are going to go up even higher. As prices have pretty much risen to their maximum level, I, I feel, and then they've stabilized. I think that we need to have some community-controlled housing that provides an alternative for people of more modest means in order to preserve the mix. The, there needs to be somebody concerned with the neighborhood, you know, not with just selling houses for a premium or, or what these houses can are worth or anything like that. It's the essence of the neighborhood. He started saying how he thought that real estate agents were driving up the prices and whatnot and what the area needed in Candler Park was uh, some kind of a cooperative, not-for-profit selling service. Realistically, unless if we do something of that sort, community-owned housing, that, that it just won't happen. And I countered with the, with the statement that, uh, okay, you live on a street where houses are now selling for forty to $50,000. Would you sell your house without using a real estate agent for thirty-five? And he immediately changed the subject. Eventually, they're probably going to sell it, and they want to get the most out of it. I don't want to see this happen, but I think probably what will happen will you won't continue to see the economic mix that we've got right now. And I think that's too bad because it's one of the reasons I like it. Well, it could be a mixed uh, neighborhood. This is a mixed neighborhood. It would be nice, but it wouldn't be. Well, too many black people live around here. There will always, I think there will always be white people living around here. We are making the neighborhood change and people are inherently are resistant to change. It's, it's a historical fact. And uh, we're singled out as the people that frequently, uh, you know, we're the bad they guys. They don't know who else to, to point and at. And it's just place. change, it's life. The neighborhoods are dynamic in nature. Nothing stays the same. Well, in the past couple of years, it's got worse. 
than what it was. People that uh, are a little bit more modern or people that are kind of, they're saying this is going to be the new village area down here. Charm. Um, a touch of the past. Something that I don't think will ever be duplicated again. That's why I want to maintain this as it is and improve upon it as time goes on. It's hard to keep up with it, especially you've not got a permanent job. If you're just working off and on, it's kind of hard to uh, keep up with. What we envisioned always is a small town, a small town, a neighborhood, which was something that we lost for a while, I think, 50s and 60s. And we'd still, we do have it now, but uh, it's being threatened. Maybe this sounds far-fetched, but in the long run, that we can develop our own sources of, of power and, uh, and fuel and, and, uh, and so on in the community. It sort of forces us uh, to become kind of like gypsies until we can find a place that uh, we can live within our means at. And it gives the feeling to me of the left bank this has been a kind of family community deal. I've been living in this house since 1918, and I was born next door in 1894. The Cattle Park section is one of the best in the city of Atlanta, in my opinion, having been here a number of years. I've had lots of uh, fond memories. Well, it's still, it's still an, a good community and a nice community to be in, but uh, it's not what it was when uh, I came up. 